Isn't that great? I just, uh, I just have a great time in children's moment. And, and I, I, I love, you know, even though they're, you know, three, four, five, six, seven years old, I'm just going to pull all of this out so I can walk around a little bit. I, I, love, I love their honesty, not just when they tell on their mama, <laughs> but, but, but I just love the, the pure honesty that, that you get when you're talking to little children because they don't, they don't, they, they just tell you how it is. They just tell you the truth. They're just honest, you know. And in, in our world, that can be re very refreshing, can it? For somebody just to be bluntly honest with us. And uh, that's one of the things I love about children's moment. I just, it's, it's great. And I'm, I'm glad we do that uh, in our traditional service. We are journeying together in a sermon series called Early Church. And we're looking at the first several chapters of the book of Acts where we see the birth of the, birth of the church, uh, especially in Acts chapter 2 on the day of Pentecost when Holy Spirit came and, and really put into place that last thing we needed to truly be the church. Jesus had been crucified and died and risen again on the third day and exalted to the right hand of the Father. So all that he had did for our salvation is, is in place. And then he told the disciples to wait to tarry in Jerusalem until they had been endued with power, uh, power from God's Holy Spirit. And in Acts chapter 2 on the day of Pentecost, that moment happened. And we just see a beautiful, wonderful, miraculous birth of the church. And a group that started out, as 12, 12 disciples. Later on, Jesus called another 70 to go out and minister as well. That turned into 120 on the day of Pentecost. We believe there were about 120 gathered there. From that moment or that occasion of Pentecost and Peter's preaching the gospel on that same day, the church grew to about 3,000. Then the church again grew to about 5,000. And then in Acts, Luke continues to tell us that God continues to add crowds of people to the church. So, man, I mean, God is blessing. Holy Spirit is moving. Miracle signs and wonders are taking place uh, at the hands of the apostles as they go out and, and minister to the needs of the people in the community. There, I believe it's in Acts chapter 3, we see the lame man at the gate called Beautiful, miraculously healed, lame from his mother's womb. Peter looks at him, silver and gold have I none, but what I have I give you in the name of Jesus Christ. Rise up and walk. He grabs him by the hand. The guy gets up. God heals his legs, his feet. He, he walks, he leaps, he praises God. And all kinds of wonderful, beautiful things are taking place in the early church experience. The church is growing. It's the size of a megachurch now. They're in Jerusalem and, and beginning, I would imagine, to kind of spill out into surrounding communities. But then in Acts chapter 5, you, you just kind of go, wow, how could this happen in the midst of all of that? And in Acts chapter 5, we, we have this account of a couple lying to the Holy Spirit. That's the title of our sermon today, Early Church, Lying to the Holy Spirit. And I just want to put a, 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 another little in parentheses out there. Don't do it. Don't do it. It is not a good idea. You will not get away with it. Do not do it. And, and it's almost out of place with all the great things you see taking place in the early church. This Acts chapter 5 almost seems completely out of place. But it's vitally and vitally important that we see that it is in place. And it's vitally important that we know, even as we serve in a happening church, a place where God is working in and through, it doesn't mean people are exempt from temptation and sin, and it doesn't mean the devil is not working mightily to try to bring people or the entire ministry down. So we need to take a look at the reality of what happened in Acts chapter 5 this morning, see where we can relate to this event to make sure, 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 I listen to myself talk sometimes and I laugh just like you did. I, 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 we want to make sure for future reference 
We don't fall into something like this. And you might say, oh, Brother Ricky, I would never sin like they did. Well, you may not, but how would you sin? That's the question. Where is our weakness? Where is our vulnerable spot that the enemy would come in and try to draw us away from God into sin that would really hurt us and and really hurt the reputation and possibly the ministry of the church? We don't want to see that happen. So we're going to read Acts chapter 5. Verse number 1 through verse number 16. And I I included verse 12 through 16 as a reminder of how powerful things are in the early church. It's a little summary again in those verses. But let's hear the event of the lying to the Holy Spirit, a summary of the power of what's going on in the early church, and, and then we'll share some thoughts with you this morning. But there was a certain man named Ananias who, with his wife Sapphira, sold some property. All good, innocent. He brought part of the money to the apostles, claiming that it was the full amount. With his wife's consent, he kept the rest. So we already have a lie in place. We already have deception in place. They think they're about to get away with something. Then Peter said, Ananias, why have you let Satan fill your heart? You lied to the Holy Spirit and you kept some of the money for yourself. The property was yours to sell or not sell as you wished. And after selling it, the money was also yours to give away. How could you do a thing like this? You weren't lying to us, but to God. As soon as Ananias heard these words, he fell to the floor and died. Everyone who heard about it was terrified. Then some young men got up, wrapped him in a sheet, and took him out and buried him. About three hours later, his wife came in, not knowing what had happened. Peter asked her, Was this the price you and your husband received for your land? He's given her a chance. Yes, she replied, that was the price. And Peter said, how could the two of you even think of conspiring to test the Spirit of the Lord like this? The young men who buried your husband are just outside the door, and they will carry you out too. Instantly, she fell to the floor and died. When the young men came in and saw that she was dead, they carried her out and buried her beside her husband. Great fear gripped the entire church and everyone else who heard what had happened. The apostles were performing many miraculous signs and wonders among the people. And all the believers were meeting regularly at the temple in the area known as Solomon's Colonnade. But no one else dared to join them, even though all the people had high regard for them. Yet more and more people believed and were brought to the Lord crowds of both men and women. As a result of the apostles' work, Sick people were brought out into the streets in beds and mats so that Peter's shadow might fall across some of them as he went by. Crowds came from the villages around Jerusalem, bringing their sick and those possessed by evil spirits, and they were all healed. This is the Word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. This is such an unusual event taking place in the midst of of some great, wonderful, and powerful things happening in the life of the early church. And again, you may hear this read this morning, and read along with me as we hear this passage uh, read out loud, reading on the screen as I speak out loud. Brother Ricky, I would never, ever do something like that. I, I, I'm just not a greedy person. I'm just not a liar. And it may very well be the case, and I hope it is. But maybe the question this morning, where might I fall short if temptation came my way? Hopefully, with the power and the ministry of the Holy Spirit, we'll say no to every temptation comes our way. But as we see in Scripture, not on just this occasion, but on others, 
People who stood in the face of temptation fell into that temptation and sin and brought great harm to their hearts and lives and often people around them. So it's important that we learn from the process of sin in this account since this particular sin may not be the one in which we would be called. One of the things that stuck with me that I learned in seminary was something our church history professor taught about what he called besetting sin. In Hebrews chapter 12, verse number 1, you hear Paul or whoever wrote Hebrews say, lay aside the sin and the weight that so easily besets us. That's the King James Version. The sin and the weight that so easily besets us. As our professor stood in class that day, he said some of the church fathers taught about besetting sins. That sin are two or three that we struggle with more than other things. It could be greed, maybe as was the case with Ananias and Sapphira, or selfishness, or pride, or lust, or lying, or sexual sins, or many other things. It could be anger. I've often heard people say about a son, he's got his daddy's temper. Have you ever heard that before? Sometimes you'll see those besetting sins go from generation to generation to generation. We want to be free to those things. We want to do exactly what Scripture says to do, to lay aside, to set aside the sin and the weight that so easily besets us. What is that thing that trips you, trips you up in your Christian walk more than anything else? It may be pride and arrogance. It may be lust. It may be lying. It may be laziness. It may be gluttony. There's no telling what it might be in your life, but chances are you know what it is, whether or not you've identified it and named it a besetting sin. But that comes from Hebrews chapter 12, verse number 1. Set aside the sin in the way that so easily besets us. We may be able to pick out some of those things as we read the story of Ananias and Sapphira. We know that they sold some property. He brought part of the money to the apostles, claiming it was the full amount. With his wife's consent, he kept the rest. Now, I just let my imagination kind of wander a little bit with this story because we have so few of the details. We have the sin they committed, but we don't really have the background of what happened other than they sold some property like other people had done in the early church to bring the money to the apostles to minister to the needs of those in the community. So I wonder, okay, honey, we can get $5,000 for this piece of property. Well, guess what? Somebody gave us eight. Everybody in town knows it's worth 5000 but this guy wanted it so bad, he popped up early and quick and said, I'll give you more than asking price if you'll sell it to me today. So a property worth $5,000 known to the whole community was sold to aid. And he thought, hmm, they all probably think we sold this for $5,000. Fair market value. Wow, that's 3000 more than what they're anticipating for us to bring to the church. Now he's starting to think, and that can be a problem, because his thoughts are taking him away from God, not to God. And maybe it's not just his thoughts, maybe it's their thoughts, because they're working together on this scheme. And once the thought process begins, oh man, we wanted to remodel the bathroom. $3,000 would get us a long ways in remodeling the bathroom. We're talking about in today's life, okay? Uh, or you might think, wow, we've been working so hard and so long, $3,000 would be a good few days down at the beach. Seafood. Salt water. Sand between my toes. God knows how hard I've been working. Wow, three, they would never know. They're expecting five. We got eight. Three thousand. Take us to the beach, condo, ocean. I can smell it now. About 30 minutes or an hour away from the ocean, we let the windows down and go, I can smell it. We're getting close to salt water and sand and shrimp. I can't wait to get there. But you know, you begin to let your mind go and take you in a direction away from God. 
What's it going to hurt? It's not going to, they're going to have $5,000 to feed the poor that they didn't have before. No. That's not the problem. The problem is you're telling a lie. You're being deceptive. They gave you $8,000 for the property and you told the apostles it was only five. And not only did you do that, Ananias, but you also conspired with your wife to do it. You agreed to lie to the church. And Peter calls them out on it and says, you did not just lie to us. Most importantly, you lied to the Holy Spirit. Wow. And for whatever reason in God's heart and mind, immediate judgment came and Ananias fell dead in his tracks. That was a severe example of the wages of sin is death. I mean, that is a severe example of the wages of sin is death. There in his tracks, he did die. And when the wife came a little bit later, about three hours later, they gave her the opportunity to do the right thing. Peter said, is this what you and your husband sold the property for? Giving her the... She goes, oh, you know what? No, no, I'm so sorry. That, that's not right. We need to come... No, she didn't do that. She said, yes. And judgment fell on her as well. And she fell dead in her tracks. And they were both buried side by side by the young men. So now that's just a tragic, terrible story. But what I want to know this morning is how can I, how can we keep from being those two people? That's what I want to know. As your pastor, as, as a Christian myself, wanting to do the will of God and wanting to never bring a blemish to my life, my reputation as a Christian, and certainly not to the church, how can I, how can we live in such a manner that this will not happen to us as we depend upon the Holy Spirit and God's Word and God working in our hearts and lives? How can we make sure this doesn't happen to us? Well, I think we look at this and we learn from it. You learn a couple of ways in life. You learn by the counsel and the wisdom of other people. And Scripture is one of those ways we learn from other people. Or you learn the hard way. Y'all know people that just don't learn unless they learn the hard way? I know some of those, and sometimes that person's me. But I like to hear from other people. I like wise counsel. I like godly counsel. I like to hear from the Word of God speaking into my heart and life to give me direction for life. So I think about Ananias and Sapphira and I'm letting my mind wander and I, I can imagine that they may have pondered what they would do with the part they kept back. And, and then they begin, they saw the money on the table. That, there it is, the big old pile of money. You know, if you see a big old pile of money on the table, it, 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 man, I mean, it can do things to you. Nothing wrong with the money. But the Bible says the love of money is the root of all evil. The love of something other than God, putting that in the place of God, that's the root of evil. Wasn't anything wrong with the money, but I looked at it too long. You know, you're flicking through the channels on television and something pops up you shouldn't be looking at, and you, you go, your thumb just freezes, and you go, no, I need to turn that channel. That's not something I need to be watching. And I'm not talking about movies, I'm just talking about regular television anymore. There's plenty of stuff we don't need to be watching. Amen? I'm going to meddling now, okay? All right. So here they go. They see in the money, and what does that represent in Scripture? The lust of the eyes. goes back to the passage we read just a few minutes ago, or we just read. 1 John chapter 2, verse 15 through 17. The lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, the cravings of the eyes, the craving of the flesh, and the pride of life enters in and controls your life and you love the things of the world instead of the things of God and you can't love the world and God you've got to love the world or God and here the love of the world is creeping in to try to destroy their life and it actually did so they're they're looking at the money and the lust of the eyes it, it begins to draw them and, and that lust of the eyes may have elicited a desire to have the money the lust of the flesh i, I you know i see it i want it now i've, I've got to have it without anybody else knowing about it isn't it interesting they want to sin but they don't want anybody else to know isn't that just how we are we want to hide it and keep it in dark places for nobody else to know. So you've got the lust of the eyes, kind of like David 
uh, back in the city when he should have been out to war, and he saw Bathsheba on the rooftop bathing. David saw her, and, and those eyes and those thoughts begin to work. The lust of the eyes begin to happen for David as he watched Bathsheba. And then the lust of the flesh kicked in. I've got to have that. I see it. I like it. I've got to have it. But you know what? After he did, then he tried to cover it up. The pride of life. He didn't want anybody to know he had sinned. And Ananias and Sapphira did the same thing. So we have to know that the sin in the world is working hard in and around us to try to draw us away from God. Watch out for the lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, the cravings of the eyes, the cravings of the flesh, and the pride of life. What do you desire to do that you don't want anybody else to know about? You know, uh, uh, an old saying years ago was, don't ever do anything you'd be afraid to tell your mom about. And that's pretty good, isn't it? Don't ever do something that you'd be afraid for your mother to know. Oh, my goodness. Wow, what if mama finds out? Well, don't ever do anything that you would be afraid for your mom or God to know. Because guess what? Those moms always found out anyway, didn't they? How did they know? Well, I'm a parent now, so now I know how they knew. All these parents are out here watching out for each other, and they're sharing those stories about what your kid's doing wrong. So there's sinful craving stirring in our hearts and lives. James addresses this in James chapter 1. He says, Temptation comes from our own desires which entice us and drag us away. These desires give birth to sinful actions, and when sin is allowed to grow, it gives birth to death. So that sin nature inside of us that we deal with on a daily basis, just like Paul talked about in Paul's letter to the church at Galatia, the lust of the flesh and the desire of the Spirit are daily working against each other. But we've got to be prayed up and studied up and wonderfully in relationship with God so that the work of the Holy Spirit will always triumph over the work of the sin nature that's in us. But we've got to know, we are subject to temptation and sin, so be on your guard. Can I tell you this morning, be on your guard. Peter was very helpful for us in 1 Peter chapter 5. He said, stay alert, wake up! If you're going to sleep in my sermon right now, wake up! It's been a long weekend and a long week, and I'm tired, and Ricky's long today. He may never land this plane. But that's how life is, isn't it? It's when you're tired, and you're worn out, and you don't have anything left to give, and you kind of get not on your guard. That's when you make the mistake. You drove too long. You should have stopped at the last the motel but you said i'm going to go to the next one and your wife said you're stubborn you go and you're driving down the highway and you start nodding yeah you know you you should have stopped back there while you were still fresh enough to stop but now you've gone too far you're beginning to get weak who does the line come for the line out for the weak one the hurt one the one that has strayed away from the rest of the pack Peter said, the devil, like a roaring lion, goes about seeking whom he may devour. Don't let him. What did Peter say to Ananias? Why did you let Satan fill your heart? Don't let him. Paul said in Romans chapter 4, sin, I mean Romans chapter 6, sin shall not have dominion over you in Christ. Sin shall not have dominion over you. The enemy will come to draw you away through the lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, and the pride of life. He will draw you away, but his way ends in death. That's exactly what James said. That's exactly what Peter said. These desires give birth to sinful actions, and when sin is allowed to grow, it gives birth to death. And I want to tell you, sometimes the death is not as quick and easy as it was for Ananias and Sapphira. Sometimes it's a slow death. And it causes more pain and more agony and more broken relationships 
and more suffering in life because it wasn't swift. Never forget, church, the wages of sin is death. The Scriptures are full of examples. But the challenge to us is just like Peter says, stay alert. Don't be the next victim of that roaring lion. Satan, the devil, the father of lies. Don't be the next victim of his. The next casualty in the kingdom of God in the local church. Stand strong in the power of God's Spirit and just don't do it. Amen? Amen. We're going to sing.